Okay, so my independent reading book was Everybody Sees the Ants by A.S. King. This is it. And this is the cover. I took it off because it was annoying me. Um, so it was published in 2011 and the genre is young adult. And basically this book is about a boy named Lucky. Um, and his grandfather was a prisoner of war um, in the Vietnam War. And his grandmother always believed that he was still alive, even though the government thought that he was probably dead. And before she died, his grandmother asked Lucky to go and find him and bring him back. And since then, he'd been having dreams that he would go into Vietnam and go on missions with his grandfather and try to bring him back. Um, yeah, also in this book... Lucky is being severely bullied by another boy at school named Nader, and one day during the summer, Nader just pushes him to the ground and scrapes his cheek across the concrete at the pool and just leaves him with this giant wound on his cheek. And then his mother sees it and decides to take him away for, for the summer, to take him away from Nader. And they go to Arizona to live with his aunt and uncle, and basically he just matures a lot. And he makes a lot of new friends, including a beautiful model named Ginny, who's well-known in her town for her commercials, her shampoo commercials featuring her really, really long hair. And he just learns that he doesn't have to deal with Nader's bullying, and he can try to control his own life. Okay. So the first school of criticism I chose my questions from was the formalist criticism. And my first question was, how are the various parts of the work interconnected? So in all of Lucky's dreams except for the last one, his grandfather is missing limbs. So in the last one, when he's not missing any, it shows that he doesn't need Lucky's help anymore and he's ready to just move on. And it also shows that Lucky is also able to move on and he doesn't need to be in the dreams anymore because they were an escape for him and um, they were the only time that he could be strong and confident and get away from the bullying. And he was able to save his grandfather even though he couldn't save himself. So in the end, it, it just shows how much Lucky has really grown, and yeah, he he doesn't need an escape anymore because he can handle his life himself. Um, also, we learn early on in the book of an incident that Lucky witnessed in the locker room. Um, he says about Nader on page 33. Then he grabbed the shortest, scrawniest kid in the locker room and threw him into the corner bench. He had his friends hold him down, take off his clothes, and blindfolded him with a smelly gym uniform. The more the kid screamed and kicked, the more of Nader's minions helped to hold him down, legs open. I could see him struggling against their hands, trying to bring his knees together. I could see him shaking, breathing heavily, panicking, gagging. So, this incident really sticks out in Lucky's mind. He thinks about it a lot, and he really wants to talk about it to someone but he really can't bring himself to tell anyone. And then we learn, as he's talking to Ginny, that the reason he didn't want to talk about it was because it happened to him. And it was really a traumatic incident for him. Um, on page 205, he says, um, Though I half lied about that because I didn't tell her that the kid they blindfolded in the locker room was me. And I didn't tell her that they took all my clothes and left me slumped naked and puke covered in the corner of the locker room, sobbing. So, from beginning to end, we really learn a lot about Lucky's life that we that he just kept vague. Um, he didn't want to admit that it happened to him until the end, and it just. It really captures the reader's attention, I think, and left me um, wanting to find out more about his life and possibly what more he could be hiding. So, 
yeah, I think it just, it really connected well. It brought the book full circle, and it was just, it was very clever, I think. Um, and then the second question I had was, how does the work use imagery to develop its own symbols? So, I said that the Frederickstown pool, which was the pool that he went to during the summer, symbolized fear, because Nader was a lifeguard there, and so Lucky always had to be around his bully, um, even during the summer, outside of school, and he just, he always had to kind of look around and make sure that he wasn't getting too close to him and he wasn't going to hurt him. Um, so, on page 50, um, he says, When I walk out of the men's room, Nader ambushes me. He pulls and twists my arm so hard I think he's going to dislocate my shoulder. He pushes me onto the concrete and pushes his and puts his knee in the middle of my back the way cops on TV do. So, yeah, Nader is just constantly picking on him and he really has free reign to do so because Lucky always has to be around him. Um, then I said the scab from the pool incident. Uh, symbolize courage because as it's healing throughout the book Lucky is becoming more confident in himself and more willing to defend himself. Um, his father always told him that fighting was for sissies um, but he realized that if he's if no one else is gonna fight for him then he needs to fight for himself. Um, and then I said that Ginny's hair uh, symbolizes control because her parents really use it to plan out her life. Um, they always scheduled her life around uh, commercials and billboards and magazine ads. Um, yeah, they just, they really exploited her hair and that was really the only part of her that they felt was important and that was the only part they paid attention to. Um, she was never really allowed to be a normal teenager um, or experience anything outside of modeling. Um, she was in the church choir and she really liked to sing, but her parents thought that she wasn't good enough and modeling was the only thing she would ever be good at. So, yeah. Um, on page 217, she says, they control me with my hair. They confine me to that billboard as if I have no other potential. Um, so later in the book, when she shaves her head, um, her parents really just overreact a lot. Um, they act like it's the end of the world, like, like she betrayed them somehow by cutting her hair. And her mother hits her, and that's when we kind of see how how important her hair really was and how much her parents valued her hair over her. Um, they were making a lot of money from the ads and they really thought that was the only reason she was worthwhile. Okay, um, the second school of criticism I chose my questions from was Marxist criticism. And my first question is, what social classes do the characters represent? Um, so I said that Nader represents the upper class. Um, he's very wealthy. His father's a lawyer. Um, he's very influential in the school district. And, okay, so on page 226, um, Lucky says, Nader stabbed me in the arm with a pencil in fourth grade. After he came back from his suspension, he punched me in the ear so hard I couldn't hear right for a week. His father threatened the school district, said if Nader got unfairly suspended again, he'd sue. So, Lucky's, Lucky really doesn't have a chance against Nader. Um, the school doesn't really do anything about Nader's bullying after, um, after his father threatened to sue. Um, no one really wants to help Lucky because they're scared of Nader's father and they know that It'll be more beneficial for themselves if they're on Nader's father's good side instead of Lucky's. Um, and then Lucky represents the middle class. Um, he's just average. He's not poor. He's not rich. He's just 
just there. Um, he doesn't have anywhere near as influence, uh, anywhere near as much influence as Nader. Um, people don't really take his claims seriously. Um, in the the first bullying incident, um, where Nader pees all over Lucky in the bathroom at a restaurant, um, the the staff doesn't really believe that it was Nader because his father is a regular customer. So yeah, and then my second question was, how do characters from different social classes interact or conflict? So, obviously Nader, the upper class, bullies Lucky, the middle class, very much, and he really has a lot of control over him. Um, he has a lot of power, and he really... He has the ability to control a lot of people and turn a lot of people against Lucky. Um, Lucky's friend Danny, uh, his neighbor, actually turned against him to be friends with Nader because he knew that Nader would bully him too if he wasn't friends with him. Um, on page 173, uh, Lucky says, as I fall asleep, I think about Ginny and the look she gave me at church, and it makes me feel that familiar sinking in my gut, the way I felt every time I've seen Nader McMillan in the hall since I was seven. He didn't need to say anything to me, just his existence would make me feel powerless and stupid. So, Nader really doesn't have to do anything to make Lucky feel insecure and scared. Um, he really just goes after him because he's an easy target and he hasn't really done anything about his bullying until the end. So, yeah, that's how they interact. Um, Nader just picks on him all the time and doesn't give him a break. Um, they used to be friends at one point, but um, it wasn't really friendship. It was just Lucky trying to lessen his bullying by becoming sort of friends with Nader by kissing up to him and trying to get on his good side. Okay, um, final reflection. I think that the formalist criticism is a lot more useful in interpreting this book than the Marxist criticism. Um, I think that even though um, a Marxist interpretation of the book is really interesting, um, I don't think that the book really focuses so much on the interactions between Lucky and Nader rather than Lucky's attempts over the summer to move past his bullying and to learn how to defend himself and really just to become more mature. I think that the book really focuses on Lucky's personal growth from his experiences rather than the actual interactions between the two. Um, I think the formalist criticism really works well because this book is very unique. Um, I really liked the way it was written. I really liked that um, Lucky tells us about the probably the most major incident of bullying in his eight years of being bullied, and then you you realize later that it actually happened to him and not someone else, like he said it was. Um, I think it just really captures the reader's attention and it keeps you wanting to figure out more. The way he talks about it throughout the book makes you wonder why it was so prominent in his memory even though it didn't happen to him and then you realize that's because it did. Um, so yeah, I think that's very unique. I think that this, this criticism, this school of criticism really works well for this book.